All right, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, oh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I grew up in Clayton, California. Clayton is where? It is up in the San Francisco Bay Area near Walnut Creek, in the East Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me about your childhood. You had both your parents as a kid? Yes. Uh, my parents stayed together until my mom actually passed in 2016 from Alzheimer's. I'm sorry. It's okay. What was, how would you describe your childhood? <sighs> really stressful, really traumatic, and a lot of drama. A lot of unnecessary drama. Uh, my dad, he was a Southern Baptist preacher from Texas. Mm. And my mom was from England, a small town in England. And um, how they got together, he was in the Air Force in England. And uh, that's how they met. Um, my mom ended up taking the Queen Mary when she was 21 years old to Texas and marrying my dad. And I don't think that she really knew him at all. She had no idea what she was getting herself into. Um, where shall I begin? So they had my oldest brother and then three years later they had uh, another, uh, my other brother, Steve. So there was two boys and then there was a 10 year gap and they had me and my little brother. My little brother's three years younger than me. My dad, he was, very angry. I would say it's, it was beyond anger. It was more like rage. He had a rage issue and he was very physically abusive. Um, and he was a preacher. And then my mom, she was the principal of the school that was attached to the church. So we were the preacher's kids and the principal's kids too, which was a lot of, a lot of pressure, especially with what was going on at home. Uh, the, the contradiction that I saw as a young child was just, I couldn't get over it. It, it was very confusing for me. So, you know, my dad, he would go into a rage over just anything, you know, for example, he would yell at me or hit me for taking my shoes off when I came into the house, you know, why'd you take your shoes off? You know? And so I would leave my shoes on. And then the next week I would get in trouble for my shoes being on. So nothing made sense. There was no consistency. There was really no method to his madness. So what I learned to do as a young child uh, was to read energy so I could sense his anger, you know, and, and either change my behavior or go hide. Um, I learned at a very young age to become very small, almost invisible, and just to have no needs because there was really no room for that in my house. He also was sexually abusive towards me. I, I don't know if he did things to my brothers. I, I can't, I, I know I wasn't there. I don't, you know, I was in the house, but I don't know. Uh, they claimed that he didn't. Uh, so what would happen, like say a Saturday night, you know, I was six or seven years old. Someone would come into my room, it was dark. I didn't know who it was. And they would be on top of me, I couldn't breathe. And then it would be over. And then the next day I would have to go to church and you know sit in the pew and watch my dad preach. And by about the end of the church service, I would have such a pounding headache that I could barely see straight. And then by kind of the end of the afternoon, I would just be vomiting uh, because I don't think that my body knew how to process what was happening. I think it was just, it was too much for me. I was just a little girl. And this went on for years and Unfortunately, my mom, you know, she she grew up in England during World War II and they were dropping bombs and, you know, her life was in danger. And then she told me she was raped by a neighbor when she was only 10 or 11 years old. And it never got dealt with. You know, she said, I, you know, this guy man did this to me and she was called a liar, you know. And so my mom had her own trauma that was never dealt with. And I think, you know, energetically, the reason my mom and dad came together, it just dovetailed perfectly is because it just continued the craziness. Um, so she was not, for whatever reason, able to protect us. She really, she did nothing to protect us. And you know, I think that there's a lot of men that can, you know, fly off the handle and get angry and lose their temper. And the, the mother's there to, you know, kind of stop, don't do this, you know. 
but she, you know, she didn't do that. So I would say the, the most painful thing, because I learned to also to disassociate as a child, like I would just leave my body. Um, especially when my dad would hit me, you know, they called it spanking, but it was like, I mean, he would beat us till we'd have bruises on our butts and broken blood vessels and, you know, things like that, you know, and then that way it was, it was a perfect cover cause nobody could see it. No one could see the bruises, you know, cause I'd have clothes on and, but the hardest part was watching him beat my little brother. Uh, he was three years younger than me and he was like this toe head kid with these big blue eyes and he was just so beautiful. He was like a little angel baby. And I watched my dad break his spirit. Like I, I, I witnessed it. And it was, it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. Um, he would turn blue cause he couldn't breathe. And my dad just wouldn't stop hitting him. And my mom would just stand there. She would just watch or she would leave the room, you know, cause she didn't want to see it. But I saw it. I saw all of it. But she didn't feel like she could stand up to him? I don't think so. I, I, don't, I think my mom never felt like she had a choice in her life. You know, I think she felt trapped her entire life and, and fit into that victim martyr role. You know, and, and that's a very hard role to give up because if you give up being a victim and a martyr, you have to take responsibility. And I think for my mom, if she would have confronted my dad about his behavior, she would have had to admit that there was something very wrong. So I think it was just easier to, to ignore it or to just, you know, somehow bypass it in her mind. So, you know, my little brother, he, he suffered a lot. He took a lot. And I, th I think my oldest brother did too. Um, my oldest brother and I, we no longer have a relationship because he's just so difficult. And I think damaged from, you know, what he went through as a child. Um, so yeah, this went on for years and I really, I don't know how I survived. I think the disassociation really saved my life. Otherwise I would have probably split and become schizophrenic or something, or just, you know, completely lost my mind. Um, so I learned to survive when I was 12 by using drugs and alcohol. That's when I was first introduced to drugs and alcohol. Uh, my oldest brother helped with that because that's what he was using. And I don't think he was trying to hurt me. I think it was his remedy. And so, you know, he, he knew what I was going through. And then when I was around that age, this, these boys moved in next door. And one of, the, one of the boys that moved in next door, he was three years older than me. And he became a drug dealer. So he would supply me with drugs. Um, I, uh, you know, did LSD. It kind of opened my mind. I think I saw energy for the first time. I realized that there was more than just the physicality of life. It was really beautiful. Um, yeah, it really, it really gave me a lot of strength. Uh, you know, I used marijuana, I did, you know, alcohol. And then, um, I started smoking crack when I was 14. And for whatever reason, you know, I didn't, I liked it, but I didn't like it that much. I didn't really like feeling that out of control. Um, so a friend gave me some crystal meth and that was home. Like the, the crystal meth was right. It was, it, it made me feel in control. I think from all the, the trauma in my childhood, my adrenals, my adrenal glands were just so drained that I had no energy. Like I didn't have natural energy. I was depressed a lot. I would want to sleep. I didn't want to really do much. So when I did crystal meth, it was, it was like someone turned the lights on. I became alive and I wanted to be around people. And I had like this inner courage and, uh, it was really, it was a lot of fun. Um, so I think that's why I didn't become a crack addict. <laughs> the, the crystal meth was better. Thank God, really. Um, but, you know, I kind of went in and out of drugs during high school. And what's really, what I find really interesting when I look back is, you know, kind of when I hit puberty is when I started using drugs. And instead of getting into guys, I got into drugs because guys just scared me. Like I was scared of men, I was scared of sex. I had my mom, you know, in one ear telling me, you know, sex is dirty, sex is wrong. Nobody will ever want you if you have sex before marriage. And then, you know, my dad on the other side of me, you know, touching me. So it was, it was I was very confused. 
I was very confused. Um, so by the time I graduated high school, I think I was just so fragmented. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted. You know, I was really pretty, and so everybody liked me, and I looked okay. And I think that that was part of the problem. Um, has been a problem in my life is, is my outer appearance did not match what was going on inside at all. You know, I kind of learned to be a chameleon and fit in with whoever and act how I needed to act to get what I wanted, you know, or to protect myself or whatever. So um, my first relationship that I actually did get into was with a man named Tom and my dad's name is Tom. And my, both my grandfather's names were Tom and one of my uncles is named Tom. <laughs> so here was another Tom. And at the time I was seeing him, I was not using drugs, I was drinking. And I didn't know, you know, at 18 years old that you could become addicted to another person. But I became addicted to him, chemically addicted to him, to the sex, to the horrible way he treated me. It kind of triggered, re-triggered the childhood stuff. So there was something about it that felt comfortable even though it was incredibly painful. Um, and that went on for three years. And um, it ended very badly. I actually ended up getting really violent and um, damaging his home, um, getting charged with assault and battery. And I fought the case because he had done things to me and the, the DA decided to drop it. So I walked away, thank God. But after that, I uh, decided to go to London and live there. I was in college at the time trying to be in college. I was not a good student. There was a lot of learning disorder issues that I had to deal with, dyslexia and you know stuff like that. Because when I was young, I remember, this is how I know I disassociated. I would get test papers back and there would be an F on them. And the, the, the test would be completely blank. And I would never remember the test being in front of me. I was that checked out. So that's sort of how I stumbled around in the world during you know, my childhood. Um, but when I was in London, you know, of course I kind of attracted drugs, you know, started doing ecstasy and going to the clubs and that just felt really good. It felt like, ah, you know, like here's a good time. Here's some, here's people that are nice to me and I feel really good and I feel full of love. And, when I came home, it was uh, 1994, and uh, I was just craving more of the club scene. So I went to San Francisco and started going to the clubs there, house music, got really into that. And then of course, the Crystal Matthews kicked in again. And those were some of the funnest times and also some of the darkest times of my life. I made some really bad decisions and put myself in very dangerous situations. I, I really don't know how I survived. I think that, you know, God's always looked out for me. You know? Um, Are you religious? I wouldn't say that I'm religious because, you know, religion was really shoved down my throat in an unhealthy way growing up. That's why I asked. Yeah. yeah, but I definitely believe in God. I do. I. I I don't think that we were, you know, created by happenstance. I just don't. I think that there's a there's a higher intelligence that just creates love and it just creates and it creates and it creates and it helps us create. And it never wants to destroy anything, no matter how ugly it is or evil it is. It just wants to love it. And that's that's really that's where I believe I come from. You know, as I look at myself today in the mirror, it's like, wow, I'm a child of God. And nobody can take that away from me. No amount of abuse or drugs or anything, nothing can take that away from me. That's mine. What about you? Have you had you have a family of your own or children or marriages? No, I... Um, I never got married and I never wanted to have children. I was just telling a friend last night when I was living in the Bay Area in my 30s, I joined this dating service and I would you know, be on a date with a normal guy and he'd be like, yeah, I wanna get married and have three kids. And I would just be like, <laughs> like I could feel my heart was like, like, the thought of getting married and having kids was like asking me to run into a burning house. <laughs> it was just like, it wasn't happening. 
I was so overwhelmed. I was so overwhelmed by just the normal things that most people do that they don't even think about it. They just do it. And for me, it was like, oh no, 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 no. Kids, family. First of all, I, I knew I was fully aware of my brokenness and I didn't want to put another human being through that. I knew I wasn't qualified to be a mother or a wife. And I was fully aware of that. Um, you know, and the other thing is I was just terrified of commitment, responsibility, you know, wanting to stay a child, wanting to be irresponsible. I think when you have kids, you have to grow up really quick or you don't, you know, some people don't. So, um, yeah, and it was really interesting in my, in my twenties, I ended up dating a drug dealer, surprise, surprise. And I was just drowning. I, I remember one day I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize myself. And this, there was this voice that was like, you're better than this, Liz. You're better than this. So I pulled myself out of it and I moved and I changed my phone number. And I stopped doing crystal meth on my own. Um, I was still drinking, you know. I was out at a bar one night with my little brother actually and a, and a couple of good friends of mine and I met a man and we ended up in a relationship for three years and he loved me. He really, he did, he loved me. <sighs> you know, but I had so much trauma that was just like right under the surface. I could only go, you know, so deep with people no matter how much they loved me. Because I didn't love myself. I felt broken, I felt unworthy, I felt crazy. I felt unlovable. That's the real core of it all, isn't it? Absolutely, is I felt unlovable. Because <laughs> if my parents treated me like that, there must be something wrong with me. You know, that's how I think I made sense of it. So he and I were together for about two years and then I started using drugs again. Cause the, the intimacy with him really triggered a lot for me. A lot of stuff that was under the surface. And I, I broke up with him, I ended the relationship and he was devastated. And I was devastated and I ended up trying to kill myself. Um, it didn't work clearly. But I, I checked myself into the hospital and I was there for a week and got stable, got on some medication and then went back out in the world and I went back to the San Francisco club scene. And within a year, I was you know, doing meth again every day. I got to the place where I started to get psychosis when I would use, you know, I would just instantly go to crazy or paranoid. So I'll never forget it. It was a Sunday, I was in this apartment in San Ramon, California and I was looking at this bag of drugs, you know, this bag of meth. And I was like, I can't imagine my life without you. And I can't keep doing this. And so once again, there was that exit door, <laughs> you know. So I drank like half a bottle of GHB and with some sleeping pills. And I left a note. I wrote a note, you know, just apologizing to everyone that I wasn't doing this to hurt anybody but it was just because of my own pain. And I woke up the next morning on the floor. I had vomited everything up on my side, thank God, because usually what happens is, you know, people are on their backs, they vomit and they out, you know, it goes into their lungs and that's how they die. Um, and when I woke up, I didn't know if I was dead or alive. But you were, you were trying to kill yourself. I was definitely trying to, yeah, this was not a cry for help. This was, I'm done. And I kind of, just looked around and my body was in a lot of pain. And I called a friend and I told her what I had done and an ambulance came and I went to the hospital again. And this time I was there for three weeks because they knew if they let me out, I was just gonna try to do it again. So this friend of mine, she contacted my oldest brother and she just said, I, your sister's gonna die. Like you guys have to help her. You know, and I, had, I hadn't talked to my dad. I didn't talk to my dad for 13 years. I was so pissed at him. So my oldest brother showed up at the hospital. Actually, my oldest, my two older brothers, he, my brother Steve came into town. He lived here in LA and this was in the Bay Area. And my mom and my little brother, they showed up at the hospital and 
the nurse came and said, you know, your family's here. And I said, is my dad here? And they, she said, no. It's your mom and, and your three brothers. And I just said, you know, tell them to go away. I don't want to see them. I was pissed that I was alive. I was just pissed. I was so angry. I didn't, I was like, I can't even kill myself. You know what I mean? It was like, I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't get what I needed anywhere, you know? So here I am and I'm angry and I just want my family to fuck off. So my brother came to the hospital every single day, my oldest brother, until I would talk to him. And finally I talked to him and he was like, you know, Liz, we're gonna, we're gonna send you somewhere and get you some help. We've decided as a family, you know, you need help. So they shipped me down here to Newport Beach to a rehab and I was inpatient there for nine months. You know, most people go to rehab for like 30 days, you know, 60 days, 90 days. and. But I literally, like, I didn't know how to live. I didn't know how to just be normal. Um, I think my nervous system was so dysregulated. My whole body was dysregulated. And my brain, my brain chemistry was just, it was just so out of balance. So I go to this place. Is it okay if I say the name of the place? Okay, it's Sober Living by the Sea. It's still around. So I go there and I'm terrified, you know, I'm, I'm 29 years old and I look like I'm 12 and you know, I'm just like a deer in headlights. Um, and there's a man there who was my case worker. He was gonna be my, my counselor, drug and alcohol counselor. And I walk into his office and I look on his desk and there's a Dallas Cowboys mug on his desk. And I was like, my dad and brothers were like avid Dallas Cowboy fans. And he turns around and he looks at me and he goes, hi, Liz. And I was like, oh, are you from Texas? And he was like, yes, I am. And I was like, let me guess, you used to be a preacher. And he goes, yeah, I was. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay. And so I told him, I told him the, the parallels, you know, and he goes, nothing's, nothing's by accident. His name is David. And um, he literally, loved me back to life. He did. He was like the first man in my life that just wanted to love me and didn't want to touch me or exploit me or, you know, do anything to hurt me. And so for about six straight months, I would meet with him every day and, you know, we would talk about stuff and <laughs> I remember one day he, he was like, he looked at me and I said, what? And he goes, why do you always have to look so perfect? Come in here with your hair messed up one day. <laughs> like, you, just, you always have to look so perfect. I was like, okay. But I really, I really made a bond with him. And I, I think what it is for someone like me, and I'm sure for other people, when people are really good to you and you haven't had much of that in your life, you never forget those people. I've never forgotten him. I just spoke to him on the phone. You know, I'm 47 now. I was 29 when I met him. I just spoke to him on the phone the other day. I, I love that man and he was an angel. You know, and there were so many parallels with him and my dad being from Texas, Dallas Cowboys, ex-preacher. You know, it was just very ironic. Um, so after I got out of there, I stayed sober for a while and then I moved back up to the Bay Area, started doing hair again. I was a hair colorist for 20 years. And um, I started using meth again. And I was like, God damn it, here we go. And I just was like, I can't do this again. I, I won't do this again. So I decided to go to AA. And I know we're not supposed to talk about AA in press, radio, film, whatever, blah, 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 but I'm going to. Um, I think it needs to come out of the shadows. Stop being such a secret. There's nothing shameful about going to AA. It takes a lot of strength to ask for help. Um, so an interesting thing happened when I got sober that time, when I was in sober living by the sea, they were always trying to bust me for like hooking up with guys. Like, who are you hooking up with? We know you get it. Cause I wouldn't relapse. I'd never relapsed because I was really strong. Like once I set my mind to something, I, I pretty much stick with it. Um, but I never, you know, I was still really scared of guys, but for some reason, when I went to AA, I became sexually active, like promiscuous. And all of a sudden it kind of came out of nowhere. I was 33 at the time. Um, and I hooked up with a guy who I didn't really like. We didn't belong together and I got pregnant. And so 
at 34, I had an abortion. It was actually my second abortion. I had, a, I had an abortion at 23 when I was dating the drug dealer, and that was kind of a no-brainer. You know, I was addicted to meth. My life was a mess. I wasn't going to bring a child into this world. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was really painful. I, I, looking back now, I feel like that baby should have been here. And, you know, I think the biggest mistake that we make as humans is playing God. And I was playing God. I, I stopped a soul from, you know, embodying a human existence. And I've, you know, had to live with that. And at the same time, you know, I was just doing the best I could. Again, I was super overwhelmed, the thought of having a child. I mean, the truth is I needed a kid like I needed a hole in my head, but I could have given it up for adoption. I could have done, you know, many other things. So that was super painful. Um, and then I started just turning to like spirituality, meditation. I would meditate for hours because I wasn't going to turn to drugs again. Um, and I saw things in meditation. It was really interesting, the spiritual connection that I was able to make. Uh, whoever was there with me showed me the circle of life, you know, how we never die. It's like we're born and we have this experience and then we leave our human body and become spirit and then it kind of goes again. So it's just, it showed me that there really is no such thing as death, that we, that, you know, that we've been taught. There's physical death. We leave our bodies, but there's definitely more than what we, we see here. And um, I'll share something that's just kind of bizarre. It was November of 2011, and uh, I was working a lot doing hair. And Sunday mornings, I would always just lay in bed. That was just like my thing. I would lay in bed and rest. And I remember it was about 10 a.m., and I was, you know, opening my eyes and closing my eyes and just kind of drifting in and out of sleep. And then all of a sudden, I heard sort of a static electricity noise, like a buzzing, like zzzz. And I was like, what the hell, what is that, you know? And so I kind of went to get up and I couldn't, I was completely paralyzed. And so I just laid there and the sound got louder and I couldn't move my body. And as I, I looked to my left side, there was some sort of being standing there. Um, it, it had shape, but it wasn't solid. And it was very, very tall. And it put something into the side of my head. And um, I just laid there and I was like, what the fuck is going on? And then as soon as I kind of like started to, you know, I kind of was able to move, it was over. And I ran into the bathroom and I looked at my head and I was like, <laughs> there was nothing wrong with my head. And I called a good friend of mine who kind of you know, knew a lot about other beings and aliens and stuff like that. And she was like, oh yeah, that stuff happens all the time. It's no big deal. They were just rewiring your brain. I was like, uh, okay, you know, if I tell people this, they're gonna think I'm crazy. She didn't think I was crazy. So I kept meditating and just like astral traveling and going deeper into this other place. And uh, it was the end of February of 2012. And at that point, I was creating so much stillness within myself and in my life that I could, I could hear things, not voices, you know, nothing like that, but I would hear like a soft voice that would talk to me and give me guidance. And um, I wouldn't notice negative things. Like I can remember being out with a bunch of girlfriends and someone would be rude to me and they'd be like, did you hear that? You know, and I'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, I was just sort of like in this higher level of consciousness, it was really beautiful and it was very much a relief and it wasn't drug induced. So I'm sitting on my floor in my house and I hear this very soft voice that's like, Elizabeth, call your mom. And I was like, Ugh. I hadn't talked to my mom in a year. You know, our relationship was very difficult and um, it persisted. So I was like, okay, I'll call my mom. Like, I called my mom and we made plans to meet that next Monday for lunch. And I realized I, I had to change our plans. So I called the house and my dad answered the phone. And mind you, I hadn't talked to him in, in 13 years. And he answered the phone and I just said, dad. And he instantly started to cry. Because, you know, I, I'm his only daughter, so he knew it was me. 
And he just said, you know, Elizabeth, I've, I've prayed for the day that you would talk to me again. And whatever I did to you, I'm so sorry. And so we sat on the phone together and cried for a little bit. And I said, Dad, you know, I don't know why I'm reaching out to you guys. I don't know what's going on and I can't promise you anything, but I, I want to show up and be a loving presence in your life to the best of my ability. And he said, I'd like that. And so I talked to my mom and we changed our plans. And um, the next day I went to work. And then Saturday morning I'm laying in my bed and I get a call from my little brother and he's crying. And I was like, John, you know, this kid's, he's a tough kid, he doesn't cry. And he said, Liz, Steve's dead. And Steve was my older brother, not the oldest brother, but the one that lived here, he, he made quite a life for himself. He became pretty famous, imitating politicians for a living. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, he's dead. They found him, his housekeeper found him on the couch dead. <laughs> And in that moment, I knew what that voice was, that, that, that guidance was telling me, you know, your family's gonna need you. And how difficult it would have been to have not spoken to my dad for 13 years and then seen him for the first time because of that. And I just said, thank you, God. Thank you for guiding me. And I was so grateful that I listened, that I listened to that voice. So I got out of bed and I just said, you know what, this is your, this is your time. You get to suit up and show up. And I was sober. Thank God. You know, I wasn't a mess. I was able to, to go towards my family and actually be strong for them. And losing my brother, Steve, it was a tragic thing, but it was also a very beautiful thing. He, he lived an amazing life and the way he died reflected how he lived. He just passed away on his couch. He laid down to take a nap and he was 48 years old. And he left behind money and he blessed my entire family with money. That's why I haven't worked. I haven't had to work. It changed my life. It was like, finally, I have this space that I can just get to know myself. That's what I've, that's what I've been doing for the past, I would say 10, 12 years, is just exploring, healing, you know, getting to know other people, learning how to love. That's been a big thing, is learning how to love, learning how to be in relationship with others. So I, th I thank my brother. He was an angel. He is an angel. <laughs> He's here right now, I can feel him. So, you know, I walked through his passing and then shortly after, my mom came down with Alzheimer's. She couldn't handle, you know, what had happened. You know, Steve was her, her everything. And so she lost her mind and died four years later from Alzheimer's. And I remember my brother calling me saying, you know, Liz, mom hasn't had food or water in five days. So I think it's time, you know. So I drove up to the Bay Area and I wasn't prepared for what I was gonna see. You know, someone who's skeletal, who's dehydrated, who hasn't had food, who's, you know, gasping for, for air. And my dad and my brother, they left the room so that I could have some time alone with her. And for a moment, there was a split second where I was like, oh my God, am I gonna end up where she is? Cause she's my mom, you know? And I just said, no, you're not because you've chose a different path. I've, I've chose to face myself and she didn't. And this is where she ended up. And I just told her, I looked at her and, you know, she was in a morphine haze. I just said, mom, I love you and I forgive you for everything. And I just want you to go and be in peace because it's never going to happen here. And the next day she passed away. So it was a lot. It was a lot. <clears throat> and that was really hard for me. I didn't really know how to process my mom's death because we, we weren't close. We didn't like each other. So unfortunately, after her funeral, I, I became a little bit self-destructive and I went on like a three-day three binge. 
And um, about a month after that, I became severely depressed. I think I was just suppressing all the grief and all the anger and, and everything. And so I checked myself into the hospital. This was in 2016. And... Um, I was sitting there with a the doctor and I said, I, I really don't want to go on medication again. I've been down that road. I'd, I'd been off of medication for about eight years. And she's like, well, look where you're at. You know, you don't you've kind of run out of options. Um, so I decided to go on medication and I take 10 milligrams of Lexapro. And then whatever that is in that stuff, it it corrected the imbalance. Like within a matter of, of hours, I felt better. I, I walked out of the hospital a completely different person. And um, I've been really, really stable and, and happy since then. I've been able to deal with life on life's terms. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not sober anymore. I do, what's really interesting, like, You know, I think that there was a time, there was an eight year period where I was completely abstinent from everything. And I needed that time. I needed that time to heal myself and to heal my brain. And now I'm able to have some wine if I want some wine. You know, and it doesn't, it's not like I want to go hurt myself. So the way I explain that to people is I had no point of reference of what it felt like to feel good before I used drugs and alcohol. So that was my point of reference of feel good. And then when I became sober, in that eight year period, I discovered what it was like to just feel good naturally. So now I have that point of, of reference and feeling good naturally without anything in your body is the best feel good ever. Like it's the best because there's no coming down. There's no hangover. There's no guilt. There's, you know, there's no self-destruction in that. That's just how God designed me. You know, all of us, we all just want to feel good. So in the last five years, I decided to go back to school. I went to a place called uh, the University of Santa Monica. It's a school of spiritual psychology. I did their two-year program. And when I was there, it was so painful. I mean, I really faced a lot of pain um, in a different way. I mean, years before, I was in and out of therapy for 11 years. And then I did group therapy on and off for seven years. But this was different. This kind of took it to another level. And it, it really changed me. It, it made me a better person. It made me a stronger person. And it taught me how to listen to others and just hold space for other people. Because really, that's all we need is just to be seen and heard. <sighs> yeah, it was life changing. It was great. In your life, what would you say is the most important thing you've learned? To accept what is and to love. Acceptance is a big thing. Just accept what is, accept what's happening and don't try to control it. Be open. Yeah. Beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks.